Thanks for uh, coming to this meeting and thanks for the Im invitation. I'd like to talk to you about the uh, current management of myelofibrosis. I'm not going to talk about any of the experimental treatments that we're doing. It's a little bit difficult seeing these slides. Um, so we all know what myelofibrosis is, but there's a spectrum of disease, and I want people to be aware of that. So some patients have early phases of disease, and some patients have more overt myelofibrosis. So the patients can present asymptomatically, or they can present with uh, anemia, leading to weakness, fatigue, shortness of breath, and cardiovascular complications. They can present with uh, symptoms due to an enlarged spleen. They can present with bleeding. And most importantly, they can present also with thrombosis. And they can also present with hypermetabolic symptoms, which we call now the systemic symptoms, which include weight loss, fever, gout, and bone pain. And the physical examination is really best demonstrated by this. This is a patient who has very far advanced myelofibrosis, but really a picture demonstrates the really dire consequences of the overt form of the disease. So if you look at this individual, you see that the patient is pale, and also you can see that there's a lot of weight loss, and there's a massive hepatosplenomegaly. So this is the end stage of the disease, and there's a spectrum of progression. I show this slide because at least we've had an outbreak of this complication in myelofibrosis recently at our clinic, and maybe it's because we haven't been as vigilant. But this is, those nodules on those fingers are tophaceous gout. So if you have gout and you have an underlying myeloproliferative disorder, it's a, a really a consequence of, of the underlying disease that you're suffering from. So many patients can present uh, with myelofibrosis, and we uniformly see patients with myelofibrosis that can be attributed to a myeloproliferative disorder. But when your internist first, first sees you, that individual, he or she, is a, essentially undergoing a differential diagnosis in their mind to make sure that the myelofibrosis is not due to, uh, to, an other, to another underlying disease. And this is a very important process. So at least in the past, this has been associated with TB, Liver disease also can look like myelofibrosis, and the most, as can hairy cell leukemia. And the most important issue is also patients with other types of metastatic carcinoma, so it's important to exclude those. And rarely patients with autoimmune diseases, such as lupus, can present with a fibrotic marrow and a clinical spectrum that's virtually identical to the patients with MPN-associated myelofibrosis. So this is our um, current understanding of MPN disease progression. Um, Dick told you about the concept of myeloproliferative disorders, and Jerry indicated that these occur at the, at the pluripotent stem cell level. So the progression of the disease, that leads to ET and polycythemia vera, and this entity that I'll call, um, that has been called early phases of myelofibrosis, or pre-PMF, these are the proliferative phases of this disorder, of these disorders. And then with the acquisition of additional epigenetic and genetic alterations, and also fueled by this pro-inflammatory milieu that's been discussed extensively, inevitably, if you wait long enough, the large majority of patients will uh, progress to avert myelofibrosis, and also a small percentage of those patients will go on to develop a form of acute leukemia called MPN blast phase. It's really important for you to realize that the early form of myelofibrosis is associated with thrombocytosis, elevated platelet counts. This slide has been shown before, so I won't go over it. So the last talk, Dr. Basis talked about essential thrombocythemia, and that's a very difficult disorder to distinguish between an early form of, of myelofibrosis or this pre-PMF. So uh, really, that can only be done by marrow uh, examination. So when your physician who's taking care of you insists upon doing a marrow, you should comply. And these are the uh, morphologic abnormalities that distinguish early forms of myelofibrosis from essential thrombocythemia. And the critical form here is really the presence of the 
megakaryocytes. You can see, and those are the cells that produce platelets. You can see that essential thrombocytemia is characterized by these large megakaryocytes. And early form of myelofibrosis is characterized by hypolobulated megakaryocytes. And the products of, of, of uh, these megakaryocytes, particularly TGF-beta, um, is uh, probably one of the inciting factors that leads to progressive uh, myelofibrosis. So the, what is the importance of the, distinguishing these disorders? Um, basically, you can see on the top panel, you can see there's the cumulative incidence of overt myelofibrosis. You can see that patients with ET have a lower incidence of developing overt forms of myelofibrosis. They have a lower incidence of developing acute leukemia, and they have a more favorable survival outcome. And that's very important. The issue is that each of these disorders, from that slide, you can see that each of these disorders progress. So although ET has a better outcome than an early form of myelofibrosis, there's a subset of patients with essential thrombocythemia, as was shown by Dr. Vasis, that will undergo evolution of this disease uh, to um, myelofibrosis or MPN blast phase. And the name of the game really right now is to prevent disease progression which is one of the goals of the MPN uh, Research Foundation. Um, how do patients with myelofibrosis die? This was best uh, defined by our Spanish colleagues. This is the causes of death in myelofibrosis. You can see the big killers are basically thrombosis, progression without leukemia, and then acute leukemia in 31% of the patients. So, we're going to, most physicians, or virtually all the physicians in this room, every one of them, tailor makes their therapy based upon risk factors that have been very well defined by a number of individuals. So these are the risk factors that are presently used uh, for significant association with sort of survival. That's age, constitutional symptoms, hemoglobin less than 10, a white blood cell greater than 25,000, and when the doctor looks at your peripheral blood smear, um, a blast a blast percentage greater than 1%. And you can see in the right column, you can see the p-values. That indicates the significance of these variables. Um, you can see that there's a lot of zeros there before the number one. So those patients who have none of those variables have, a, have low risk disease. Those patients who have two, three, or more you can see have a progressively shorter survival. So the treatment for patients is going to be very much tailor-made to what your risk factors are. And those patients who are intermediate or two, serious consideration should be given to those patients undergoing allogeneic stem cell transplantation, which Dr. Von Biesian will talk about after my talk. The other issue is, is to remember the ages of the patients. So remember I showed you that these patients progress. So the issue really is that those patients with low risk or intermediate one disease, although they might not require disease treatment immediately, if you're 30 years old and what we're really worrying about is what's going to happen to you when you're 50 or 60. That's really the key point. So we've refined these, um, the, at least the community of MPN physicians have combined these variables uh, to better define the, um, like the uh, prognosis of individual patients. You can see that a couple of um, uh, values have been added to these. That's platelet count less than 200,000. Triple negativity, those are patients that don't have a MIPL mutation, a JAK2 mutation, or a CalR mutation. Those patients do uh, poorly. Um, also, patients who have a JAK2 mutation or MIPL mutation do less well than those patients who have a CalReticulin mutation. And then um, Dr. Moliterno was talking about these additional mutations. Um, the most uh, lethal ones are basically ASXL1 or a spliceosome gene called SRSF2. So one of the real pro problems is, is essentially to determine in a young patient, let's say who has the ASXL1 mutation, whether to go forward with more aggressive therapy or, or whether to hold back. 
So this is the number of mutations in prognosis in myelofibrosis. You can see that you do better if you have uh, no mutations. And as your mutational profile increases, your estimated survival. So I can tell you that I follow many patients who have, based upon this scoring system, have multiple mutations, but never progress, at least for the 10 or 15 years that I've followed them. So these are averages and should not be taken as, as total dogma. And as was pointed out uh, earlier, I guess, by Dr. Spivak, that individual patients have to be treated on an individual basis. So um, I also took the liberty of uh, uh, taking this presentation from ASH, uh, which was presented by Dr. Vanuki, which on, uh, itemizes or shows the differences in clinical and molecular characteristics of those patients who have early stage disease and those patients who have overt myelofibrosis. And the reason why I'm going through this very defined um, dissection of the disease is that we have patients who come very frequently, who have early stages of disease, who claim, I say claim, that they've been told by their doctor that they're going to die in one to two years. And fortunately, that's not correct for the large majority of patients who have early forms of myelofibrosis. So that's why I'm trying to emphasize this to you, that the diagnosis, let's say, of an early form of myelofibrosis is not equivalent to those patients who have overt forms of myelofibrosis. So Dr. Vanuki gave me these slides, so I'll go over them with you. And these are just the hematologic and clinical abnormalities in the early forms of myelofibrosis. In myelofibrosis, I'd like you to uh, concentrate on the hemoglobin values. You can see that the patients have lower hemoglobin values if they have overt forms of myelofibrosis. And again, those patients with uh, early forms of myelofibrosis have thrombocytosis. You can see one of the patients had a, a platelet count of 1,500,000. The, there's a greater number of patients that have circulating blasts if you have the more overt form of the disease, as well as constitutional symptoms, spleen size, also um, unfavorable karyotypes. So um, this is an important slide, and it basically shows the overall survival in the left uh, diagram and the leukemia-free survival in the right diagram. And it shows that patients with the early form of myelofibrosis essentially have an intermediate survival and chance of developing leukemia in between ET and the more overt forms of myelofibrosis. And here's the mutation profile. Let's just uh, basically look at the bottom. Uh, you can see that the ASX mutation is much more common in those patients who have overt myelofibrosis, as is many of these other secondary mutations. So you would infer at least that these secondary mutations are associated and perhaps causative of the evolution of disease. This again shows the, the um, patients based, their survival based upon the number of mutations. And you can see those patients who have low molecular risk, high molecular risk, which is two mutations in addition to their driver mutation, or greater than two mutations, as you have more mutations, your estimated survival um, is poor. And this again shows, this is the progression-free survival. You can see overt myelofibrosis has a much higher uh, chance of, um, of progressing to more extensive disease, as I showed you in that picture, but then prefibrotic form of myelofibrosis. But prefibrotic myelofibrosis you can see that these are long follow-up studies, up to 30 years. And if you have a patient who's 20 or 30, you're going to be alive in 20 to 30 years, hopefully. And you're at risk of this disease progressing. So how do we present, prevent disease progression? How do we prevent patients with early forms of myelofibrosis to progressing to um, more overt forms of myelofibrosis? One approach is to use recombinant interferon. And uh, this is a study that Dick published in Blood a number of years ago and is subsequently updated. And you can see that there are a group of patients 
who have reduction in spleen size and have some hint of at least a partial molecular response. And some patients undergo improvement in um, hematologic parameters, perhaps suppression of blood counts or uh, improvement in anemia. The issue is, does such treatment um, lead to a lack of progression of disease and a lack of evolution to um, acute leukemia? Hopefully, that will be true, but I think that needs to be tested in larger patient populations. So what are the treatment of overt myofibrosis? I'm going to just concentrate on the drug treatments. Dr. Von Biesen will talk about the Aleph stem cell transplant. So we're talking here about patients who have uh, far advanced disease, who have, uh, at least based upon what I've shown you, a reduced lifespan. Our treatment is really largely palliative unless those patients go on to allogeneic stem cell transplantation. And the agents used include many of the drugs that you've seen, danazole, corticosteroids is a very effective drug in reducing anemia in these patients, as is thalidomide. Splenectomy sometimes uh, is required if somebody has uh, splenic symptoms that cannot be reduced by jacophy. Transfusion therapy is really our core therapy to treat patients with cytopenia. Erythropoietin stimulating agents are helpful. Melphalan rarely is used. Hydroxyurea is currently recommended as the number one treatment for those patients who have thrombocytosis by the European Leukemia Net. Interferon I discussed and the JAK2 inhibitors are really uh, a, a way of making patients improve their survival uh, with these uh, drugs. And then we talked about allogeneic stem cell transplantation. I mean, their symptoms. So patients have a multitude of symptoms, and that include abdominal pain, nausea, early satiety, and weight loss. That's due to splenomegaly. They have their consequences of this inflammatory milieu, which is called, which leads to pruritus, bone pain, and fevers. And they have microvascular compl com complications due to thrombosis, and there are concentration issues. Vertigo is a very common complaint that our patients have. Headaches, lightheadedness, dizziness, numbness, tingling, and insomnia. And then these catabolic proliferative um, complications and fatigue, night sweats, and, and, and basically just not able to, able to do your everyday activities, and also gout. So the goals of therapy with drugs, at least at present, is symptom release, relief, improve anemia, improve bothersome splenomegaly, and halt progression to acute leukemia. And eventually, I think, we'll get there with cure. Um, so here's the drugs that we use. I'm not going to go over each of them, but our armamentarium is very limited. And that's why the pharmaceutical in industry is investing so much money in this particular disease, even though it's relatively rare. Um, because we have such limited tools. So you can see that for anemia, uh, basically, the most active agents are the corticosteroids, danazole, erythropoietin, and then frequently patients respond for periods of time with thalidomide or lenalidomide. And I have a patient who's been on thalidomide for almost eight years, which to me is very remarkable. The best agent, I think, for treating uh, symptoms and also splenomegaly is surely Jacophon. Um, this is not going to be a drug that's going to prevent disease progression, but it is going to make you feel better. And that is, it's going to make the, your performance and your everyday life much, much better. And the, you know, there's a, been a buzz whether this d drug is really what it's made out to be. But in reality, when you treat patients every day, it's quite obvious. And the studies would substantiate that this is a useful drug. Um, we talked about the constitutional symptoms. And really, the only drug is that improves su survival is allo stem cell transplantation. So just to go over this Comfort One study that was uh, published by Dr. Um, uh, Verstavik, this is a randomized trial. There have been many iterations of this. But this is a uh, ruxolitimid, 15 milligrams or uh, 20 milligrams BID versus uh, uh, placebo uh, per day, I should say, or placebo. And you can see that there's a 
marked reduction in spleen, and they were using as a metric 35% reduction in spleen. Some patients get benefit from this splenic reduction, even if they don't achieve that degree of reduction in splenomegaly. And you can see that it's durable, because you can see the, the weeks from initial spleen volume reduction. Um, <clears throat> the problems with ruxolinamide are basically, and really, it, you're titering the effect of ruxolinamide on the marrow and also on the systemic symptoms and uh, splenomegaly. You can see that frequently, patients cannot tolerate this drug because of anemia and the development of thrombocytopenia, lowered platelet counts. So as you can see here, the discontinuation time over time increases as patients are exposed to this drug for longer periods of time. So this is a pooled analysis that was in several of these publications suggesting that ruxolitimate uh, might uh, prolong survival, and there is probably some minor component of that, but Cervantes in Spain and also the Cochrane Data Meta-Analysis Group have questioned that. So that's an area of controversy, whether sustained ruxolitimate therapy will prolong survival. And that's important because are we going to use this drug, which is very, very costly, in early phases of myelofibrosis? And that's a question mark. So I would look at this as a, con as a controversy, not as a fact. So ruxolitimid was approved in November of 2011. Its main suppression is uh, myelosuppression. Um, it's approved for patients with a platelet count greater than 50,000, although the initial patients were treated, had to have a platelet count over 100,000. And you can't just go off into the sunset and take ruxolitimid. You basically have to be very closely monitored because of the need to dose reduce and to make sure that you don't have any, any toxicity. It has great potential to palliate symptoms. Um, and the question I raised, should low-risk patients get ruxolitimate? That's an unknown. What are the complications of ruxolitimate? So one of the major complications is if a patient goes off the drug, they have a, a, base, uh, a potential to develop um, basically a cytokine storm, reappearance of the splenomegaly. We've had patients that have developed sort of dire, not sort of, very dire pulmonary complications. So what we do is usually taper the patients slowly off the drug, don't discon discontinue it abruptly, and treat those patients with, uh, with steroids. The other problem is reactivation or sort of unusual types of infection. So for sure, Patients with uh, ruxolitimid have an increased risk of developing <coughs> shingles, which is uh, obviously very un un uncomfortable. And they have also a risk of an increased risk of developing pulmonary tuberculosis, cytomegalovirus uh, um, uh, um, infections, and a variety of other unusual <coughs> type infections. So one has to be very careful about monitoring for these complications. And obviously, zoster, since it's so painful, um, <laughs> patients um, need to get uh, pain management and careful control of that drug. What is the long-term consequences of ruxolitimate therapy? Because it's an immunosuppressive drug. Will it lead to increased malignancies in patients in, that in taking this drug? And that's really an unknown uh, factor, and will be followed with long-term follow-up. The big problem is here. These are patients who had overt forms of myelofibrosis, who we treated with ruxolitamine. They felt terrific. This particular individual developed this rash on the top, which turned out to be le acute leukemia. So it does not appear, at least in our, when we analyze it, that this, this drug prevents progression to acute leukemia. So these are the folks at our research group at Sinai that uh, have done all this work. Um, and um, I really like, sincerely thank you for your attention. Thanks.